number two. Um, and that's, you'll find that up on Canvas. Um, and that'll be due when we get back. When I put it up there and assigned it, I, the, I didn't know that the schools were being closed yet. So there's like a due date listed, but obviously if we're not in school then, then, um, then you don't need to turn it in at that time. Um, so we'll uh, we'll sort of just play that by ear. Does everybody on Canvas? Or everybody's everybody's obviously on Canvas, but like I don't know if you all have the app or if you check it. But um, that's a great way to be in touch, uh, to have like um, access to the materials that are posted. Um, and uh, so this initially, again, this was all before um, the. They were before they decided to close the schools this week. I was thinking this week we'd finish chapter three, which we almost will. Um, and then, uh, and then I thought, well, that would make next week a great time to have the, our tests on chapter three. Obviously, that's um, on hold. So I'll just put a little question mark. It'll be sometime after we get back. Um, so what I want to do for the time that we have uh, today is do some more curve sketching. Um, after this curve sketching bit, there's one more um, one more uh, section of new material. Uh, tomorrow we're planning to have a quiz, um, and uh, if we get all the way through today's material, then uh, I'll, I'll still have that be the plan. I do kind of want to make sure we get through this curve sketching bit uh, before we leave for a while. Uh, so we'll regroup at the end of class. Uh, before we uh, work on curve sketching. Does anybody have any questions? You over 21. Yes, I can. Let me just, I'm going to pull it up on my phone. Um, I thought it was going to put a lot. Oh, hold on a second. <laughs> My phone doesn't want to give me access, but I know I've got it on the desktop. I know this one is correct. This is a uh, This is Monday stuff, I think. Okay, which one? 21. 21 on 2.6? A and B. A and B, right. As soon as it lets me get there. Hey, Rachel, I had Buff and Bob of white paper, so they're going to have their uh, extra problems printed on graph paper. Okay. Wow, this is a, uh, I don't think I've ever seen um, the ebook take this long to load. Uh, is it, is it, 
it's is there a chance it's faster for you to like uh, describe what that problem t- says? No, you have to work from part A to part B, and I don't know how to do part. Here, I'll text you a picture of the problem. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. That's perfect. <laughs> Oh, the ladder problem. It's a ladder problem. Okay. Right, ladder problem. Yeah. So I know generically what the ladder problem is, but. Uh, Oh, there we go. Oh, nice. Okay, 2.6. A ladder leaning against a wall. Uh, tw- uh, let's see, 25 feet long. Great. Okay. So this length they're calling R and R is moving down. The base of the ladder is being pulled away from the wall at a rate of two feet per second. Um, so they, they part, part A asks about at what, how fast is the top of the ladder moving down the wall. Was your question specifically a part, about part B or, or parts A and B? Part B. Part B. Okay, consider the triangle formed by the side of the house, the ladder, and the ground. Oh, find the rate at which the triangle is changing. The rate at which the area of the triangle is changing. Ah, when the ba- when the base of the ladder is seven feet from the wall. Okay, great. Um, all right. So look, they call that side the the vertical side. They they call that R. We have a nice right triangle here, and we know the hypotenuse is always twenty five. So if we use Pythagoras. This length along the bottom is the square root of 25 squared minus r squared. And um, I think from there, do we even need to give that a maybe? Okay. Um, so the area is one half base height. So one half, I'm gonna call that side A. I don't know if I'm gonna to need to replace it with a radical or not. A, A times R. Yeah, you know what, I think we do need to put that radical in there. So one half R times the square root of 25 squared minus R squared. <laughs> And in part A, you answered how fast, let's see, when the base of the ladder is seven feet from the wall. I'm trying to think of the easiest way, like I'm trying to be clever about this. You know what? I don't like using r as the variable because we know I'm getting we know the rate at which the base is moving out. So I don't like using r as the variable. So <clears throat> I'm going to um, I'm going to switch this around. I'm gonna I'm gonna say I'm gonna use a as the as this length, and I'm gonna say that this r is the square root of. Uh, 25 squared minus r squared uh, minus a squared uh, because we know that d a d t is two. And so the area is one half a times the square root of, 25 squared minus a squared. 
And we want D capital A DT. I guess I didn't have to pick little a in this problem, but I, but I did, so there we are. Normally, you know, when we did this ladder problem, we just kept the Pythagoras in like a squared plus r squared equals 25 squared. Um, and that worked the whole way down, you know, because a and r were the only, like little a and little r, the two sides were the only variables we needed. But now we need an expression that involves the area itself, which is why I've kind of switched over to writing the uh, radical expression for the other side. Um, I think this will work. So um, if we differentiate the side, we'll need the product rule on the right side. Um, but we'll get something like the ADT is equal to, um, let's see, one half A times, and then the derivative of that stuff. So that's the one half power. So it'd be one half 25 squared minus A squared times a negative two A, D ADT, D little A ADT, plus, and then the derivative of the first would be one half times d little a dt times the radical or times the stuff to the one half power. Oh, that's a negative one half power there. All right, we have some simplifying to do. Uh, I'm going to take out the negative one half power. I'm going to take out, I think, a one quarter, which will take care of that. And I'm going to take out the DADT. So one quarter DADT times this stuff to the negative one half power. So in, in for this first term, I took out the one quarter completely. That's to both factors of a half. I took out uh, the DADT. I probably didn't need to take out the whole one quarter, but I'm going to go with it. Um, and now what I have left is negative 2a squared. Plus. Now I took out a one quarter and I have a one half there, which means I need a factor of two. That's why I think I, I didn't need to take out the full one quarter because I'm going to be able to take out a factor of two, but that's fine. And then we took out the negative one half power and we have the positive one half power here, so that means we're going to have a positive one power left. And I think I'll I'll take out that two now that I've been sort of yammering on about it for a minute. So we have a negative a squared plus 25 minus a squared. Take this out. It'll cancel with that. So the inside we've got 25 minus 2a squared. I'm going to just simplify this a bit. I've got the negative one half power, which is the square root in the bottom. Ooh. And then the one half means I've got a factor of two in the bottom. And up top I have 25 minus 2a squared over two times this radical. And then a factor of dA dt. So I think if, if I did this correctly, this should be the expression that tells us how the area is changing as a function of the that horizontal side. We know that dA dt is equal to 2. Yeah, oh yeah, so this is equal to 2. And that'll cancel with that factor of 2. 
So now we have it just as a factor, of, uh, function of a, rather. And I think we can plug in the value they were interested in, which was seven feet. So I get, I got a negative, approximately negative 3.04. This would be square feet per second. And that would be, a, a, that would say that the area was decreasing at approximately 3.04 square feet per second at that moment. Five twenty-seven. What? Over twenty-four. Oh wow. Okay, that's definitely not three. Huh. I wonder. You know, I was. I wonder if I. I mean, I, I don't know. So there definitely could be an error in my in my work here. And I also wonder if there was an easier way to do it. Look, uh, so if I if I did like one half a times r, like there are one half base height, if we use the, the product rule here, we have one half a times dr dt plus uh, one half r times da dt, basically, right? We know that this is 2, and that cancels there, and we could certainly, oh, ha, huh, okay, hold on, let me fix that, all right, da dt. So, um, in part a, you found dr dt when a was equal to 7, we know that we're interested in what's going on when a is equal to seven, and we could find r when a is equal to seven. I feel like I, I was I was worried about being clever about doing this, and and I went and did it the wrong way. That doesn't address like what mistake I might have made when I um, did out this problem, but it certainly gives us a way to figure out uh, to another another way to to try to to solve this problem. So. When R when uh, when A is equal to seven, so um, R is the square root of twenty five squared minus seven squared. which is 24. And in part A, you found DRDT when A was seven, right? What did you get for that result? 6.857. 6.857. Seven. So let's try putting this stuff in. Oh, wait, I have negative 6.85. Negative, 
plus 7 when r is 7. Okay. Uh, so... Huh. <laughs> That's even worse. Never mind. <laughs> Yep. Yeah, okay. So, uh, so for, forget about this. That that seems like a pipe dream. Um, I don't feel like. All right. Well, I guess I have some homework to do because I'm gonna have to figure out where the error is. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna try one more. I'm gonna look at one more thing. Um, I'm gonna look at calc chat. So this is 2.621. Oh, they had, so the answer that they give in CalChat is 527 over 24, not 224. Oh, oh, okay, maybe you did. I just misheard. Oh, and that's still like 21 point something. Oh, they got, uh, when, okay, so, they got a do, like, that DRDT, I think they got negative 7 twelfths, which is 0. 0.583 and not negative 6.857. Okay. Yeah. So I think uh, I think this uh, this approach up here could could work. I still have to find my error with the first way that we did it because I think that should work too. Um, but I think this this approach will work if um, if we have the right value for DRDT. Okay. Anyway, that's how you would go about it. Um, I'll I can report back with a with an announcement on Canvas with finding my error the first way that we went through it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, other questions. All right, so we're doing some more curve sketching. We did a bunch of curve sketching last time. Right now we're gonna take all those skills we learned and extend them to rational functions. And a rational function is just one where you might have some division, some X's in the denominator. Um, and when that happens, you get some kind of interesting behavior uh, at, some, at certain points. So the, just we're just recapping first with like the information we get from the first and second derivatives. We look at F prime to see whether our function is increasing or decreasing. We can also use make a sign chart and detect maxima and minima. Um, our second derivative tells us about concavity. Is it concave up or concave down? Uh, it tells us where we might find inflection points. Um, and also, it gives us another way of determining whether we have a max or a min uh, once we find a critical value. So we have this general procedure down here for curve sketching. Um, the first thing I always do is, is just try to figure out what the domain of the function is. That's never a concern with polynomials. In the last section, the domain is always all real numbers. Our function is defined everywhere because we're not dividing by x's. So 
Um, now that we are the possibility of X is in the denominator, that's going to restrict our domain a bit. And, um, and then determine if there are any vertical asymptotes. So vertical asymptotes can happen at values of X that make us divide by zero. So basically we just want to like check out the function, see what we're not allowed to plug in and what happens there. Usually that's going to mean a vertical asymptote, which is just this vertical line that a, that a function kind of approaches. Um, like it, when, when your graph gets close to a vertical asymptote, it'll either shoot upwards to infinity or downwards to negative infinity. Um, the next thing I do is find any intercepts of the graph. No calculus needed here, that's just algebra. And then we get to the calculus parts. We get our first and second derivatives and, and get all of our information from that. And now um, part four here, step four, this is new. Determine the behavior of the graph as x becomes large. With polynomials, as x becomes large, it just sort of continues growing uh, upward or downward in kind of a smooth fashion. Um, we get different kinds of behavior with these rational functions. Sometimes we'll get a leveling off behavior. Sometimes it'll grow to infinity, but in a linear fashion. So in order to figure out what your function's doing, we take the limit as x approaches infinity. Um, if the, excuse me, if the limit as x approaches infinity is some constant, then we get a horizontal asymptote at that constant. Your graph just sort of levels off and starts approaching that value. Um, this next part is a little weird. If x if the limit as x approaches infinity is mx plus b, then y equals mx plus b is a slant asymptote. So this is another way of saying, like, look, if the limit as x approaches infinity of your function is mx plus b, that means that the limit is still infinite, right? I mean, as x gets huge, mx plus b still gets huge. But we're trying to figure out how it gets huge. Um, and so this says if it, if it gets huge in the same way that this linear function does, then you have a slant asymptote, which is just a dotted line. You know, the, you, you draw that y equals mx plus b dotted, and then as x gets big, it just sort of approaches that. We will see an example of this later. Um, so um, so if, that, if that appears confusing for you at first, uh, don't worry. Hopefully we'll, we'll clear that up when we actually see one in action. Um, and then the step five is just like it was in the last section. We're going to summarize all of our information <clears throat> and use it to sketch the graph. So we're going to do a couple of examples. I'm going to I'm going to start out doing stuff in the top margin here, some stuff we can get out of the way. The first step was the domain. So let's just notice, right? So our function is eight divided by x squared plus four. Um, that denominator x squared plus four is never zero, right? So like x squared plus four is not equal to zero for all x. And that means that the domain is all real numbers. We are not in danger of ever dividing by zero. The second thing we want to find, that we want to turn our attention to, is the intercepts. The, again, this does not require calculus. Zero, if zero is in the domain of the function, you can always find the y-intercept, right? We'll just plug in zero. So, when we do that, we get eight over four or two so 0, 2 is the y-intercept. How do we get x-intercepts? That line to the Mm-hmm. So we're going to set y equal to 0. just means set the whole function equal to 0. So what does that look like? That gives us the equation of... Uh, 8 over 
x squared plus 4 equals 0. Can somebody tell me when the fraction 8 divided by x squared plus 4 is equal to 0? Never. 8 is never 0, right? The only time a fraction is 0 is when the numerator is. This is never 0. So that means there are no x-intercepts. Right, so we got kind of the, the beginning stuff uh, done. Um, now let's turn our attention to the calculus bits. Let's uh, find derivatives. So looking at this function, 8 divided by x squared plus 4, I could use the quotient rule, um, but I think it'll be a little bit easier if I just rewrite it, because there's no x's in the numerator. So I know if I rewrite this with, with the x squared plus 4 to the negative 1 power, I won't have to use the product or quotient rule. That'll be a little bit easier for me. What do we get when we find y prime? Really close. There's one thing missing here. Yeah, we have the negative 2 power. Now I'm going to rewrite this back in a fraction form because it's going to be more useful to me that way. So I've got a negative 16x on top and then divided by the square of x squared plus 4. This is really convenient for like analysis, right? For making a sign chart, for example. This is easier to make a sign chart of than the line before it. Um, and so when we're looking, so what critical values do we have here? At zero, yeah, zero is the only critical value. It is certainly the only thing that makes the derivative zero, right? 16x is zero when x is zero. We also, critical values, if you recall, in the last uh, section were where the derivative is zero or undefined. So if you're looking for critical values, you also have to consider where, the, where you might divide by zero, right? Where it might cause division by zero. That's still a critical value. Of course, that doesn't happen. X squared plus 4 is never 0. Uh, but just so we're aware that that can give us more critical values than, than we would have expected in the last section. Um, and we can make a little sign chart. So we have a row for negative 16x. We have a row for the square of x squared plus 4. And then a row for y prime. We have a single critical value at 0. We know that negative 16x is 0 at 0, and it's positive on the left and negative on the right because of that negative in front of the 16x. And the next row is just always positive, right? It's, it's x squared plus 4 is always positive, and if you square that, you're super extra positive. And that gives us... row for y prime. And then that we just sort of set aside, right? We're going to we're going to use this, we're going to put it in our table when we summarize all of our information, but I think we've kind of exhausted the first derivative at this point. And now we can find the second derivative. Now when we found the first derivative, we were able to kind of avoid the product quotient rule stuff by, you know, using negative exponents. Here that's impossible, right? Um, if I if I rewrote it with the x squared plus 4 to the negative 2, I would just be turning a quotient rule into a product rule, which doesn't really save any work, I don't think. So I'm going to go ahead and just use the quotient rule to find the second derivative. So 
So g times f prime. g is x squared plus 4 squared times f prime is negative 16. Then we're subtracting f times g prime. Negative 16x times g prime would be 2 times x squared plus 4 times 2x. And then this is all over g squared. We're squaring the square, so we're going to raise that to the fourth power. All right, this is a mess and nothing that I want to make a sign chart for, so we really got to clean this up. Um, I'm going to take out, let's see, I'm going to I'm going to just tidy up the individual products first and then I'll worry about factoring. So I got a minus 16 x squared plus 4 squared. This will be a plus um let's see. I'll say 16 times 4x times x squared plus 4. Now, I rather than multiply 16 times 4, which I think gives you, what, 64, I just wrote it as 16 times 4 because I can see what's coming, right? I'm going to take out the greatest common factor. There's clearly a common factor of 16, so I'm just trying to make my work a little bit easier for myself. So I'm going to take out that 16 and... I'm going to take out the x squared plus 4 just to the first power, right? We always take out the least power. Oh, and you know what? Hold on. Um, in the first line here, we have the 16x and a 2x. So down here, this should be a 4x squared. Okay, now let's take out the factor of 16 times x squared plus 4. What goes in the brackets? Negative x squared plus 4. You have the negative of x squared plus 4, yep. Plus 4x squared. Great. And then we'll just simplify the stuff in the brackets, which is... Uh, we get uh, 3x squared plus 4, I think. And then uh, we can cancel, right, an x squared plus 4. So here's a factor of x squared plus 4. So we'll just have x squared plus 4 to the third power in the bottom. Three x squared, oh, minus four. This uh this little negative sign. Okay, we worked hard for that one. There's our second derivative. All of this is hopefully to, you know, give us some insight into this function. What is the set? What type of information do we get from second derivative? Mm-hmm. Yep. We could make a sign chart, figure out where it's concave up or down. Um, 
And then if we have a change in concavity, what do we call that? Yeah. So let's make that sign chart. Um, to make that sign chart, we need to figure out where the second derivative is zero. So um, where it's zero or undefined. Again, the bottom is never going to be zero because it's x squared plus four. Um, but you know that what's going on with the signs of the denominator changes the signs of the overall function, which is why um, we have to keep track of those values as well. Uh, but let's see. The second derivative is zero happens only when three x squared minus four is zero, right? The bottom is never, so it's never undefined because the bottom's never zero. Um, the top is only zero when three x squared minus four is zero. And so that means that we could just solve this equation. Three x squared is negative four x squared. Oh no, positive four. Boy, I'm full of sign errors today. X squared is four thirds. And then we'll take a square root. So we have plus or minus 2 over root 3. Which, if we're using this to actually plot points, um, I'm going to get an approximation. One point one five, so plus or minus one point one five. Now I'm I'm glad we're gonna be doing a sign chart for this because usually when we do these sign charts, we're able to get everything down to linear factors. Um, or, you know, like up like we saw up here, it was like a quadratic, or in this case fourth power factor, but that was always positive, the sign never changed. Now we have a quadratic factor um, whose sign does change. Uh, and so here's what this is going to look like. First of all, I just want to, I just want to, um, let's see. We can make this side chart pretty simple because the bottom is always positive, right? X squared plus four is always positive, And if you cube a positive, you're still positive. 16, I'm going to go out on a limb here, always positive. So the sign of Y double prime is affected only, is in fact determined entirely by the sign of 3x squared minus 4. So we really, you know, I'm making a row, I'm calling it the row for y double prime, it's also just the same thing as the row for 3x squared minus 4. So we have these two spots where it's 0, plus or minus uh, 2 over root 3. Now, usually with these linear factors, it's zero in one spot. On one side, it's always negative. On one side, it's always positive. Here, we have two spots where it's zero, but it just kind of cuts up the real numbers into three sections. So we're just going to test a value in each of these uh, intervals. So if I plug in something less than negative 2 over root 3, like if I plugged in, I don't know, negative 10 or something, right? So if I plug in negative 10, the 3x squared part that's going to be like positive 300, right? If you square negative 10, you get 100. I'm going to multiply it by 3, and then I'm going to subtract 4. That's positive. Um, so we get a positive value here. If I plug in something in the middle, my favorite number to plug in, if I can do it, is 0 always, because that's easiest. If I plug in 0 to 3x squared minus 4, I get negative 4, which is negative. And then if I plug in something bigger than 2 over root 3, like maybe I plug in positive 10, That'll give me a positive. So we have um, we have our sign chart for the second derivative. We could deduce some things about concavity and inflection points. I think what I want to do right now is um, maybe kind of summarize some of this information. We still haven't done the behavior as x becomes large, and we're going to do that in a bit. But I just want to kind of get some of this um, information organized. Let's see. OK. I think I got space right here. So this is where we have our interval. y, y prime y double prime conclusion. Our points of interest. 
are any of the critical values in places where the second derivative is zero or undefined. So we have just three of them. We have it zero and then positive and negative two over root three. So we're gonna use those three values to kind of partition the set of real numbers. Our first interval goes from minus infinity to negative two over root three. Stop and see what's going on there. And then negative two over root three to zero. Stop and see what's going on at zero. And then uh, zero to two over root three. Two over root three. And then two over root three to infinity. The y column we only plug in for the actual values that we get, uh, the, the, the places that we're using to partition the real numbers. So at zero, we found that the y coordinate was two. We found the y intercept in the beginning. And then we just need to figure out what are what's the y coordinate at two over root three and negative two over root three. So um, I'm gonna scroll up just to look at the original function real quick. Whatever the value is, uh, it has to be the same for positive and negative two over root three because the only place x appears in that function is when it's being squared. So changing the sign of x doesn't matter. It's not gonna affect the value of the function. Um, so this gives us, uh, let's see. Uh, four thirds plus four, which is eight over, of course you could do this on the calculator, I just like uh, arithmetic. Uh, 16 thirds three halves hmm. is what we get for the y coordinate. Okay, that y prime uh, row, right? So we already made the sign chart. We're just gonna take that, think about picking up that row, like kind of rotating it 90 degrees and putting it right down in that y prime column. We know that it's zero at zero. And for values less than zero, it's positive. And for values greater than zero, it's negative. Similarly, we have this uh, sign chart for y double prime. So we're gonna pick that up and put it right down in the y double prime row. We know that it is zero at negative two over root three and positive two over root three. It is negative in between and positive on either side. And then we have some conclusions to draw. Let's start at the top row from negative infinity to negative two over root three. What um, conclusions can we draw? Increasing. Increasing. Yes. Great. What's happening at negative two over root three? It is increasing. Say that again. It's an inflection point, yeah. The second derivative is not only zero there, but we can see that the sign changes. So it, it's gonna switch from concave up to concave down. So in this next row, it's concave down. We can see the y prime is positive, so that means it's also increasing. 
What's happening at zero two? Like what's happening at that point? Y intercept. It's a y intercept, but what else is happening? This we, we can see that the first derivative is zero. You know, it's a critical value. Okay, so leveling off and concave down, leveling off because the derivative is zero. So what happens, what do we call that? You know, it's, it's when it's concave down at a critical value. Say that again. The minimum. Uh, no, that's actually gonna be a maximum. Concave down, a minimum has a concave up shape here. A maximum has a concave down shape. All right, what's next? Decreasing? Concave down, great. Um, at two over root three, we have another inflection point, right? That's decreasing, first of all. And the second derivative is zero. And we can see that it's gonna go from concave down to concave up. So there's another inflection point. And then what's going on at our last interval from two over root three to infinity? Decreasing. Concave up. Great. So we're going to take what we have here and I'm going to start plotting it. We're going to start seeing what this looks like. I, don't, I, I didn't really al allow myself much space in the below the x-axis, but um, if we, you know, here's the, here's the function, right? Eight divided by x squared plus four. I didn't allow myself any space below the x-axis really because I don't need any space below the x-axis. Um, eight is always positive. We've already observed that x squared plus four is always positive. This function lies entirely above the x-axis. We have uh, this point at zero two that we know is a maximum. And then we have these other points at, what was it, 1.15 we said, and then three halves. So that's maybe like there and there. So we have in this, in between these two inflection points, um, we've got increasing to decreasing in a concave down manner but it heads into these inflection points and then it kind of changes to concave up, like so. I've done better sketches, but you know, this'll, this'll have to do. And then it says it keeps decreasing out of this, right, in the concave up manner. Now what we don't know yet is exactly like what happens as X gets huge. Um, I think as X gets huge, I mean, actually the, the calculus way to answer that question which I'm going to do over here on the lower left side of the page. Um, the calculus way to answer that question is to take a limit as x approaches infinity. As x gets really large, what happens to 8 divided by x squared plus 4? Yeah, so this limit is zero. So we took the limit, we got a constant. 
right? In this case, that constant is zero. So that means that y equals zero is a horizontal asymptote. So that means that as x gets large, this thing just keeps ap approaching the, the x-axis. And it looks something like that. Pretty rough sketch, but we, we have an idea of what the behavior is like. Let's um let's uh, spend some time on this next one. We have one more uh, curve to sketch, and we might be able to get all, all the way through it. Um, so first of all, we start with the domain. Our function is x plus four divided by x. What's the domain of that function? Or any 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 values not allowed? Well. Zero. Yep. So x can't be zero, and we get a vertical asymptote at x equals zero. So the y-axis is a vertical asymptote. Uh, intercepts. First of all, we just just determined that. Uh, x equals 0 is not in the domain, so that means there's no y-intercept. For x-intercepts, we would set y equal to 0. So I have that equation there. If we start by clearing denominators, multiply everything by x, we get but on the left side, when we distribute x squared plus 4 equals 0, x squared plus 4 is never equal to 0, right? I mean, x squared is at least as big as 0, and then we add 4 to that. So this never happens, which means there are no x-intercepts. So there's our information that we can get before we get, you know, do the derivative stuff. So let's turn to calculus. Let's get our derivative information. Now, the way they gave us this function, there's an easy way to find the derivatives, or easier way to find the derivatives. Finding the derivatives will be simple. Once we get the derivatives, we want to write it in a way that makes the analysis a little easier. So I'm going to rewrite this function as x plus 4 times x to the minus 1. We're going to be able to get both our derivatives really easy, right? That's just power rule derivatives. So uh, y prime is 1, uh, 1 minus 4x to the negative 2. And y double prime is positive 8x to the negative 3. No product or quotient rule needed for either of these, right? So we're we took advantage of algebra to, to make the calculus easier here. Now we want to go back into fraction mode. We don't want negative exponents when we're making sign charts and stuff. Um, we want to have nice fraction forms so that we can uh, have, have a nice way to analyze these results. So this first derivative, I'm going to rewrite this now in a way to make the analysis easier. We have 1 minus 4 over x squared. And I'm going to write it as a single fraction. This is 1 over 1, but I need to zap it with an x squared on the top and the bottom. So we have x squared minus 4 over x squared. And if I'm making a sign chart, I'm going to go one step further. I'm going to factor the top. The top will factor. I'm going to factor it. And now that's a sign chart that's not too bad. I got two linear factors on top, and then I have just plain old x squared on the bottom. What are the critical values? Uh, 
positive and negative four. Positive. Oh, they would be positive and negative four if my factoring was correct. Um, of course, x squared minus four doesn't factor as x plus four, x minus four. It factors as x plus two, x minus two. So of course, that means that we'll amend your response to say positive and negative two. And what else? What's another critical value? Zero, Zero right? Because critical values include spots where the first derivative is undefined. So now we'll make a sign chart. There's x plus two, x minus two, x squared, y prime. These rows are pretty simple to fill in. Um, x plus two is zero at negative two. It's negative to the left. It's positive to the right. X minus two is zero at two. It's negative to the left. It's positive to the right. X squared is always positive except at zero where it is zero. Now, um, when I fill in this last row, the first derivative is, is equal to zero, negative two, and at positive two, but it's not zero at zero, right? At zero is where the first derivative is undefined, so I usually indicate that by writing a little box. Like it's not going to give me a max or a min or anything, I just am not allowed to plug it in. And then analyzing our signs here, um, two negatives and a positive gives me a positive. In between, I've got a negative. From between zero and two, I have another negative, and then at greater than two, it's positives all around. The second derivative, actually, first I'll just pause for a moment and see if there are questions on how we made that sign chart. Okay, so the second derivative, I'm going to rewrite this. And instead of 8x to the negative 3, I've got 8 divided by x cubed. Now, it's 8 divided by x cubed. y double prime is never 0. So there are going to be no inflection points. However, it's eight divided by x cubed. X cubed can change signs, and that means so can y double prime. There will be, um, we will have parts that are concave down and concave up. That point of interest for us is right when x is zero, of course. At zero, y double prime is undefined. If I plug in something negative, uh, if you cube a negative, you get a negative, and 8 divided by negative is a negative, so it's negative on this side. And if I plug in a positive, the whole thing is positive. So we see that while there's no inflection point, we do have a part of the graph that's concave down and a part of the graph that's concave up, which is interesting, right? We have a, we have a graph of this function that, that changes from concave down to concave up, but there's no point where that change happens. There's no inflection point. And the reason is because that happens on either side of, of where the domain, you know, where there's a break in the domain, right? X equals zero is not in the domain. We get interesting behavior when that happens. Um, the last thing that I, uh, I want to do before we um, maybe summarize and stuff, I want to make sure that I talk about this today in this example is the behavior as X becomes large. So we're looking at the limit as x approaches infinity of this function, which is x plus 4 over x. Now, as x gets huge, as x gets huge, what happens to 4 over x? It becomes small, right? In fact, it'll get closer and closer to 0. This thing approaches 0, the 4 over x part approaches 0. Now clearly, as x gets huge, x gets huge. So overall, when I look at this, I could say, yes, 
As X approaches infinity, the function itself approaches infinity, but that's not what's so interesting about it. What's interesting about it is that as X approaches infinity, the function approaches infinity in precisely the same way that Y equals X approaches infinity. So for that reason, I'm, I'm, I'm writing it this way. I'm saying that the limit as X approaches infinity of X plus four over X is X. I, what I'm saying here is that the four over X part of that function becomes insignificant to the behavior, to what this function does. And what becomes the overpowering part of the behavior is just that first term, that X term. Um, and that means that Y equals X is a slant asymptote. So um, let's see if we can not summarize. I, I feel like we might not get all the way to the sketch, but let's see how far we can get to summarizing this information. Our points of interest were negative 2, 0, and 2. So minus infinity to minus 2. And then minus two to zero. Zero to two. Two to infinity. Um, at negative 2 and 2, if you plug those values in, you'll get a y-coordinate. Uh, uh, when you plug in negative 2, you get a y-coordinate of 4, uh, negative 4. And if you plug in positive 2, you get a y-coordinate of 4. At 0, that's not in the domain. So I'm just putting x's through everything there. And this is where we have our vertical asymptote. If we put our sign chart for y prime down the y prime column we have positive zero negative negative zero again at two and positive for the second derivative it was negative in the beginning and then on the other side of the vertical asymptote it's positive just sort of putting down that information that we already wrote up in the sign charts above We could draw some conclusions here. I'm going to kind of go through this. Uh, I know that we're all gotten some practice in, at doing this, but uh, in the interest of time, um, from negative infinity to negative 2, it's increasing concave down. At x equals negative 2, it's concave down at a critical value. This is a max. At our next interval, it's decreasing concave down. On the other side of the vertical asymptote, Still decreasing concave down, uh, concave up this time. Uh, at our next row, it is concave up at a critical value. That means it's a minimum. And then finally, it's increasing concave up. We could kind of put all this together. There's only two points that we have to plot, right? We have uh, 2, 4, and negative 2, negative 4. The negative 2, negative 4 we know is a, is a max, and the 2, 4 we know is a min. We know that we have a slant asymptote at y equals x. Here's how I'm going to plot that. It's just a dotted line, y equals x. I'm just drawing that as a dotted line. And we know that the y-axis is a, is a vertical asymptote. So look, here's what our graph is doing. Um, our first interval from negative infinity to negative 2 is increasing concave down. So that's like this. It turns around, and it's 
uh, decreasing concave down uh, for the up until it gets to that vertical asymptote. At a vertical asymptote, it could do one of two things. It's going to either shoot upwards to infinity or downwards to negative infinity. And for us, it's going to shoot down. As x gets huge in the negative direction, it's got to start hugging that dotted line. On the other side, we're going to have kind of mirrored behavior. It's decreasing into this minimum. And again, as x is, gets close to that vertical asymptote, it's got to shoot upwards to infinity there. Then it uh, turns around. There's our minimum. Then it's increasing in a concave up manner. And as x gets huge, it's got to start hugging that slant asymptote. So here's that graph. Um, questions on that example? I know that was a lot to go through kind of in a short amount of time. Okay, um, tomorrow's quiz, we got all the way through this, so I think we'll stick with the plan of having tomorrow be a quiz day. Um, so there's four problems. There's a, there's a problem where you're going to find a tangent or a normal line. There's a curvilinear motion problem. There's a related rates problem. There's a curve sketching problem, but it's not a full curve sketch. It's just... Can you tell me, like I give you a function, it's a polynomial, so it's not this section, it's like from the last section. Um, and it's, um, can you tell me where it's increasing or decreasing, or can you tell me where it's uh, concave up or concave down? It's a type of question where you're going to find a first or second derivative and make a sign chart and use the sign chart to answer questions. Like I don't say make a sign chart, but it's the type of question where you'd be like, oh, I'm just going to find this, I'm going to make a sign chart, and then I can find a max or a min, or I can tell you where it's concave up or concave down or something. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, what, about people who are here what about people who are not here tomorrow? Um, so uh, I guess that's a good question. Um, I mean, we had good attendance today, but I guess if we're missing people tomorrow, um, I don't know, I guess we could just, the other option is we could just have class and finish the chapter. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. Can we have a take-home quiz? You have to be able to turn it in, though. Like, it's not oh. going to be a take-home quiz that you just... I mean, the the point of a quiz is to get some feedback on work. So, I mean, are, is people, are people in a position to, like, submit work from home? Or... Yeah, I, I can stand it. Right. Yeah. Okay, but, I'm, I, but I, there's an equity issue. And, like, maybe not... I, I don't know if, if everybody has, like... There's, there's ways for people to like be able to use their smartphone to make like a PDF or something, and that's possible. But I don't want to just have a take-home quiz and then not have everybody be able to turn it in, if that makes sense. Why don't we, uh, how about this? Why don't we have class tomorrow? Um, and, then, and then we'll uh, devise a plan in the morning. Thank you. All right. Thank you.